um, there was a lady that like, came over to the house, and this lady was, uh, you know, all dressed in nice, fancy clothes with all these beautiful jewelry and rings and things around her neck, and, um, and she was walking with her mom in the courtyard of their house, of their home, and her son realized. Wow, look at, look at mom. She looks kind of plain next to that lady, doesn't she? Well, her other son responded, I don't think mom looks plain at all. I think she looks beautiful. Look at her beautiful braid, her hair. Uh, it just kind of crowns her head just so beautifully. And they realized that mom um, spent her money on what was wisest and giving, her, um, giving them an education and helping them um, get through school. <laughs> and, um, as this woman was walking um, with Cornelia that day, this woman asked Cornelia, she said, Cornelia, is it true that you have no jewels? Is it true, as I have heard, that you are too poor to own them? And she said, you know what Cornelia told this woman? Just as her sons were walking into the courtyard, she said, no, I am not poor. Here are my jewels. And she pointed to her sons. They are worth more than all the expensive gems you have shown me. And you know what? Her two sons grew up to be great leaders in Rome. Um, they led the government and they were leaders in bringing um, and helping the poor people. Um, and creating societies for where these poor people um, could be able to find homes and jobs to support themselves. You know, boys and girls, there's more to life than just toys, than expensive things. In fact, God tells us um, not to, there's a commandment, and the Ten Commandments in the last one says, do not covet. Can you see the word covet? And that, that means to want things that we don't have, that we don't need. And there are more things precious to us than jewels and expensive toys. And so I want you to, boys and girls to know that it is more fun and, and better to enjoy the things that we have, the blessings that God has already given us, and not to always be just wanting and wanting and wanting things. Enjoy what you have and be grateful for what God has given us. Can we do that? Yes? Okay. So who would like to pray? I thought your name, your hand. Yeah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you for this day. Thank you, Jesus, for all the people who came today. And thank you for help us to learn new things every day. And just to know who the things, things that you can want us to do. And thank you for this day. And bless all those people from the church and all those people who are sick and people who don't have it. Amen. Amen. Good to see you, Sister Nika. Amen. Uh, this time we're going to be having uh, Brother Malachi is here, and he has decided to join our church by profession of faith. Amen. And at this time we're going to be going through some of the questions with you, Brother Malachi. Are you able to stand, or you you have to sit? If you if you can't do it, you can sit. You're able to stand? Okay. All right. Um, so we're just going to ask some, I'm just going to ask you some questions, and you can be the affirmative. I believe there is one God, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Unity of three, co-eternal. 
eternal persons. I accept the death of Jesus Christ on Calvary as the atoning sacrifice of my sins and believe that through faith in the shed blood I am saved from sin and its devil. I renounce the world and its sinful ways. I have accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, believing that God for Christ's sake, has forgiven my sins and given me a new heart. Amen. I accept by faith the righteousness of Christ, my intercessor in the heavenly sanctuary, and accept his promise of transforming grace and power to live, to live a loving, Christ-centered life in my home and before the world. I believe that the Bible is God's inspired word, the only rule of faith and practice for a Christian. I covenant to spend time regularly in prayer and Bible study. I, do. I accept the Ten Commandments as a transcript of the character of God and a revelation of His will. It is my purpose by the power of the indwelling Christ to keep His law, including the Fourth Commandment, which requires the observance of the seventh day Sabbath as the memorial of creation. I look forward to the soon coming of Christ and to the blessed hope when this mortal shall put on immortality. As I prepare to meet the Lord, I will witness to his loving salvation and by life and word help others to be ready for his glorious appearance. I believe in church organization. It is my purpose to support the church with my tithes and offering and my personal effort and influence. I believe that my body is a temple of Holy Spirit and will honor God by caring for it, avoiding the use of that which is harmful, abstaining from all unclean foods, for from use, manufacture, and sale of alcohol beverages use, manufacture, and sale of tobacco in any of its forms for human consumption and from the misuse or trafficking in narcotics or other drugs. I know and understand the fundamental Bible principles as taught by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I propose by the grace of God to fulfill His will by ordering my life in harmony with these principles. I accept the New Testament teaching of baptism by immersion and have been baptized as a public expression of faith in Christ and his forgiveness of my sins. Amen. At last, I accept and believe that Seventh-day Adventist Church is the remnant church of Bible prophecy and that people of every nation, race, and language are invited and accepted into its fellowship. I desire to be a member of this local congregation. We have read these, these questions and he has answered in the affirmative. But God will give you a new heart. Amen. Through the empowering of his Holy Spirit. Amen. And your desires of being a member of his church, but not only a member of his church, but a fellow heir for the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. So it is my desire, whose desire it is to accept him in membership. First, second, did any questions? All in favor? Aye. Those opposed, it's carried. Praise God, brother. Brother hey, God is going to ratify your decision today and forever. And we'll see him in glory together. This time, sister, our church clerk will come and give you a certificate. It is so good to see you all. I have one question by a show of hand. Who will tell me what is happening tomorrow? Cooking class. Taste and see? Cooking class. Yes. Don't forget to invite yourself 
and anyone you come in contact with, invite and come. Test and see cooking class tomorrow. Don't forget that. At 4.30. 4.30. Test and see cooking class. And by a show of hands, who will tell me what is happening on Wednesday? Food bank. Volunteers needed. Don't forget food bank. And tonight at 7, there will be the evangelistic meeting with Elder Dwayne Lemon will continue. So it's not only this morning at 7 o'clock also. Um, please keep in your prayers those who are on their bed and at home. Uh, we have the list here uh, as well as uh, don't forget to pray for people who are um, committing to following Christ as they come uh, day after day in the evangelistic meeting. And with that, I would like to welcome who is a special person visiting Mission Hope for the first time. Do we have a special person visiting us for the first time? It seems there is no one. So if that is the case, I'm going to invite our courses to help us um, as we greet each other. Uh, we may not uh, move around, but right there where we are, front and back, we can all greet each other with welcoming and hugging. Thank you. We sing Spirit of the Living God.
pray. Our loving Father, we thank you so much for the blessing of bringing us all safely through another week. We thank you for your amazing grace and loving kindness, not merely to us, but also to those whom we love. And Lord, as we have come here today to worship you in spirit and in truth, we are praying for the presence of your Holy Spirit, for he is the one that takes your words and allows them to have a sanctifying effect upon our hearts. And our desire is to become more like Jesus. And so please help us to behold him today. And by beholding him, may we all become changed into the same image. Amen. This is our prayer that we do humbly ask. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 We remain standing for our opening hymn, hymn number 412. Cover me with his life. 412, cover with his life.
for his wonderful mercies, but also to bring our cares and place them in his hands, for there is nothing that is impossible for our Lord. We'll sing standing on holy ground.
Today's offering is for the local church budget. As we contemplate on the uh, local church budget, I want us to watch this video explaining what it looks like regarding the local church budget. In the book, 2 Corinthians, chapter 9, verse 6 and 7, the word of the Lord reads, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. I will ask the deacons to stand. Let's pray. Loving Father, thank you for entrusting us with your riches. Now as Resostrous as we return what you have given us, so that your cause, your people will hear the gospel. I pray that those who give cheerfully will be blessed. And those who don't have the means now to give it, I pray that you will enrich them as well. Use this money to further your cause and bless the gospel to be spread. I pray this in the loving name of Christ. Amen.
for of peace as in all the other churches. Amen. But 
God gave it to us to also bring a revelation that sometimes we're not used to taxing our minds in the study of the Word of God. And some things in the Bible are easy to understand. But there's other things in the Bible that require some serious mental effort. And what we're going to do by the grace of God is have a combination of all of it in our time together. We're going to put together some time where we're going to look at a little bit of history. We're going to do some time calculation. But we're also going to review some things that I believe should be fairly easy for us to understand. Ultimately, the goal is that by the grace of God, we will all come to an even greater knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. His soon coming and our desperate need to get ready, get ready, get ready. And so as we prepare our hearts for this study, I'm going to go to my knees because we need to pray. And I'd like to invite you, if you're able to, to kneel with me. If you cannot kneel, please, just bow your head reverently. But if you can kneel, let's kneel together. Our loving Father, we are ever so grateful. We are thankful for the privilege to be able to look to your word for wisdom, counsel, and instruction. Right now, the world and many of the churches at large are in absolute confusion. And you promised us that you are not the author of confusion, but of peace. And Lord, it's peace that our hearts need. And part of the way you provide that peace is by giving us an understanding of your will and how things will play out in the end of time. We are grateful that you win. And anyone who is united with you will win also. And so please do something special today. Make even the words that normally would be complicated, make it plain. Help us to be able to hear it to receive it in our hearts. Let it have its sanctifying effect upon us and then enable us to even effectively share it with others. And we know that this cannot be done by mere might or by power, but only by your spirit. Amen. And so we ask for his ministration to work on each of our hearts at this time. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are picking up from where we studied last night. Last night we talked about a little horn power. That little horn power, we were able to look at Bible prophecy and beginning tonight, we're going to look even more closely. The Bible speaks about a system called Babylon. And one thing we know for sure about Babylon, if you don't know anything else, it is not the friend of God. And when you are not the friend of God, then by default, you're his enemy. And so it is that the Bible tells us that there's an enemy power called Babylon. And tonight, we're going to unmask who that enemy power is. But God gave us a snapshot when he began to tell us about a little horn power that was going to reign and rule over the people of God in such a way that it alarmed Daniel. And therefore, there was a question that was asked. And the saint asked, how long will these things be? And what shall be the sign of all these things and how long? And the answer that was given was, unto 2,000 and 300 days. And then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now go to Daniel the 8th chapter with me. And I want you to see the relevance of why this question had to be asked, how long? It, when God presents a prophetic statement that is Definite. Nothing can change it. And it looks bad. Anytime God would make it known to his people that something is coming and he knows that it's going to look bad, God knows that the natural question that one asks when they know I can't change it, it's coming and it looks really bad, is the next thing that you want to know is, well, how long is it going to last? That's a natural question. If I can't change it, if I can't stop it, then I at least want to know, how long will this be going on? Well, I want to give you a picture. Just look at Daniel 8 with me, and I want you to see what the Bible says in verses 24 and 25. In Daniel, the 8th chapter, verses 24 and 25, I just want you to see how Daniel 
was one who loved God. And if you relate to Daniel and you love him, then I'm sure if you read a statement like this, certainly you would want to know, how long is this going to last? The Bible says in Daniel, the 8th chapter, we're looking at verse 24, and it says, and his power, talking about this little horn, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power, and he shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper and practice and destroy the mighty and the what? The holy people. Now, Daniel was counted amongst the holy people, okay? Daniel is one of the holy children of God. He has received the holiness of God by faith, and he knows prophetically that there will be a people in the future that will also be partakers of God's holiness and righteousness. And now Daniel's reading about a little horn power that's going to practice, and he's going to prosper, and he's going to destroy the holy people. In other words, his brothers, his family, his brethren. And so it says that in verse 25, and through his policy, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hands, and she, he shall magnify himself in his heart. And by peace, this is a weird statement, and by peace shall destroy many. Well, isn't that strange? How can you have peace and destruction at the same time? It says, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also, now this is where it really gets offensive. It says, he shall also stand up against the prince of princes. Who do you think that is? That is Jesus. But I am so thankful for how the verse closes. He shall stand up against the prince of princes, but how does the verse close? It says, but he shall be broken without hands. That was a hopeful statement. In other words, when Daniel is seeing this prophetic picture, his people, his God, and the truth is all going to fall under attack. But then, as painful as that was, God gives that one little ray of hope in that closing statement. But the Bible says, but he will be broken without him. So when you see that, the natural question that comes up in the mind is, Lord, how long is this going to be? And God says, unto 2,300 days, and then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, I am so sorry. If you are just joining us for the first time, then you are not going to understand when we talk about the sanctuary being cleansed. But for those of us who were here last night, and then also Wednesday night, we walk very carefully and prayerfully in understanding these terms, judgment, and then, of course, the sanctuary being cleansed. And we know that that's a time that God doesn't just make decisions, but class, what kind of decision is God making? He's making what? Final decision. Amen. Oh, that did good. You sounded beautiful just repeating that. Man, I love that. God is getting ready to make a final decision. And only one or two things are going to happen amongst God's people in the final decision. Either they get cleansed or what else? Cut off. It's a final decision. And so we need to find out when is the time that God begins this process of making those final decisions. To either cleanse me, cleanse you, or God forbid, cut me or cut you off. And so it is that after Daniel saw this picture, look at what it says in Daniel 8. You're still in Daniel 8. Look at what it says after Daniel saw this picture in verses 26 and 27. This vision was so startling to the prophet Daniel that the Bible says in verses 26 and 27, it says, and the vision of the evening and the morning which was told is true, meaning it's trustworthy. But then it says... Wherefore, shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. Verse 27, And I, Daniel, fainted, and was sick certain days. Afterwards, I rose up and did the king's business, and I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. This is how Daniel 8 closes. A powerful vision. A vision of the longest and the last prophetic period in all the Bible. It has so much incredibly deep last day meaning. This prophecy particularly affects you and I. And this is why it is so hurtful. And you know, and I say this as, as one who is also plagued by this reality. You know, when I was as young as 10 years old, 12 years old, 15 years old, 18 years old. 
When I was all those ages, you know what I was able to do really well? I was able to turn the TV on, and I would watch TV. I'd watch my favorite shows, right? And when I would watch my favorite shows, I remember that I could watch those shows so well that I knew how to merge my character into what I was watching. I could imitate the voice of the person I was watching. I could imitate the tone of their voice. I could imitate their words. I could even imitate how they walked. I could just, I would merge myself into what I was beholding. You understand that? And there was a time I used to love hip hop music. So, you know, I could, I could literally listen to hip hop music and I would just start repeating the rhymes from my head and I would just go ahead and I'd do the body language and everything. I'm just acting totally like what I was watching. You know what that taught me? My mind was really strong. My mind had the capability of observing something, studying something, and then applying it in my own life. Do you know young people were supposed to understand these prophecies that we're talking about right now? If they were just beholding it. If they were just studying it. Because today we have a generation of youth that are incredibly intelligent. They know how to pick up dance steps by watching it just a few times on a television screen. They know how to listen to lyrics from a song, and it's just a few times from the song, and their brains have the ability to take it in, and all of a sudden they can just repeat back the verses and everything, and they can act like the artist and all this stuff. I mean, young people today are a very sharp generation, but they're just sharpening their minds in a completely wrong direction. There was a time in the 1800s that literally children as young as six and eight years old could repeat the words of the prophecies we're studying right now. Six and eight. We need parents to get so desperately back to this. So that way it's not just older adults that love to talk about prophecy, but it's young generation, the children that know how to do it. You know, the Bible told us about a crisis that would come. Can I show it to you real quick? Go to Isaiah 28. I'm going to show you something from Isaiah 28 that a lot of people hardly ever pay attention to. Hardly. I'm talking about Bible teachers. A lot of teachers don't pay attention to this. But it was always in the scripture. In Isaiah, the 28th chapter, God saw a crisis that was going to come amongst his people. And when God saw a crisis that was getting ready to come amongst his people, you know, one thing I love about God is you can't catch him off guard. God can see problems, but he always has a solution, as it were, in his back pocket. He's always ready. Now watch this. In Isaiah 28, God saw a problem. It says in verse 5, in Isaiah 28 and verse 5, it says, In that day shall the Lord of hosts be for a crown of glory and for a diadem of beauty unto the residue, the remaining, of his people. Now watch this, verse 6. And for a spirit of judgment to him that sitteth in judgment, and for strength to them that turn the battle to the gate. Verse 7. It says, but they also have erred, meaning they made mistakes. What was the mistake, and who were the people that were making it? Look at what it says. But they also have erred through wine. And then it says, and through strong drink, are out of the way. So God had some people that was part of the residue, the remaining. But the problem even with them is that they were busy drinking wine and getting drunk. I wonder who was drinking wine and getting drunk. It goes on to say in verse 7, the priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision, they stumble in judgment. This is a problem. you got to understand this problem. This problem is being pointed out right through the Word of God. God already had a majority of his people that were going wrong. But God would have a remaining of his people that he wanted to lead aright. But even the remaining of the people, the remnant that he wanted to lead aright, their priests and their prophets were busy getting drunk. And as a result of that, the prophet, you know what a prophet was called before they were called prophets? 1 Samuel 9.9 9 says they were called seers because they were able to have the vision of God presented to them. But now they err in vision. 
So now they can't see straight. You know what the priest? The priest was the one that would always perform the work of judgment in the sanctuary. But now the priest is drunk. So you know what that means? He errs in judgment. You don't want to know how big a problem this was? The prophet represented God to the people. The priest represented the people to God. They're both drunk. So now there's an absolute discommunication between heaven and earth. Now watch this. Continuing in verse 8, how bad was it? It says in verse 8, it says, For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness, so that there is no place clean. This is how messed up the situation was. Now watch how God solves the problem. Verse 9. Verse 9 says, Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? You see, when the priest and the prophet were drunk and no, no longer able to minister, God had to now give somebody the knowledge he normally would have given to the priest and the prophet. And so the question is logical. Well, whom shall he teach knowledge now? Whom shall he make to understand doctrine? I wonder what God's answer was. He says, those who are weaned from the milk and those who are drawn from the breast. God knows that when he can get a young person to finally understand who he is, you can be a solution to the problems that are happening in the churches as well as in the world. That's the reason why, young people, the devil is trying to so hard to get you to sleep during church service and to stay up during a movie. That's why the devil does it. He wants you to sleep when the sermon goes on. But he wants you to stay awake when you're acting silly with your friends and pretty much doing nothing that builds up your mind, your character, or your personality. See the fight that you're in. You're being pimped and you're being played by the devil. It's time to wake up. Amen. You're the ones that need to teach these prophecies. We older ones will guide and instruct and help mold you. But you're the foot soldiers that's to hit that ground and light up the earth with the everlasting gospel. Amen. Daniel was sick. He saw what was taking place in his heart, ached, and he couldn't understand it. And so as a result of that, here it is now in Daniel 9. In Daniel 9, you find Daniel praying. In Daniel 9, Daniel is praying. He's trying to understand, Lord, you have just given me a most startling vision. I don't know what's going on. I don't fully have an understanding. And so as Daniel is going through this vision, he's praying. He's interceding. Look at verse 16. I love Daniel. You know, when I go through Daniel, um, I challenge any of you in this room, any of you who are teachers of the books of Daniel and Revelation, students or anything, I challenge any of you, find anywhere from Daniel 1 to Daniel 12. There's only 12 chapters. If you study Daniel chapter 1 to Daniel chapter 12, you cannot find one recorded sin that Dan commi Daniel committed. You're not going to find it. I find nothing, in fact, I find nothing in the entire Bible that records specifically Daniel's sin. But, look at something Daniel says in Daniel 9 and verse 16. In Daniel 9 and verse 16, as he's praying to God, he recognizes what has taken place. And notice what he says in Daniel 9. And now we're considering verse 16. Daniel says, Oh Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee. Let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city, Jerusalem, thy holy mountain. Because for who sins? He says, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. You know, one of the things I love about Daniel, he is humble. Daniel is so humble. You know, the children of Israel rebelled against God over and over and over again, and that's ultimately what brought on their captivity. I don't have any recording that Daniel joined in the rebellion. And by the way of his lifestyle, I would think he didn't. But when Daniel got to the point of confessing, he did not talk about what they did. You understand that? He said he talked about what we did. 
Daniel included himself. Isn't that beautiful? Do you know some of you right now are so busy watching YouTube that you're watching a they ministry. You're watching a ministry that constantly says, look at what they are doing. Look at what they are doing. Look at what they are doing. By implication, look at what I'm not doing. And some of you have the nerve to give that man all your attention. If you're going to be saved to serve, you've got to recognize you are someone that needs to be served so you can be saved. Some of you know exactly what I just said. Daniel said, look at what we did. But we have no recording that Daniel ever rebelled. But he says, we. Pay attention to ministries that say we, not they. Listen, what I just said to you will help some of you pass from death to life, what I just said. Stop entertaining and stop supporting ministries that constantly say they, but not we. Amen. God. Focus on the ministries that say we. That's a very deep point I just made. Now, Daniel says, we have sinned. Our sins, Lord, have brought this judgment upon us. We. Moses had the same attitude. Lord, Israel sinned. And Moses did say, Lord, forgive their sin. But then Moses also said, but Lord, if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book of the living. That's the ministries you need to watch. That's the ministries you need to support. Not the ones that say their sins and go get them, Lord. But no, Lord, we have sinned. If you cannot forgive them, Father, I'm so intertwined with my people. If you won't save them, then blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book. And you know what God loved about that? God said, you know, that's the character of my son. You know why? Because 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, Christ became sin for us. The one who was completely righteous, the one that has no record of messing up, was the one that says, I will take on your guilt and give you my reward. This is the mind of God, not the characters that hide behind YouTube and constantly talk about what they are doing. Seems like there's something in this for all of us. Daniel is pleading with God. Daniel is crying out to God, Lord, I've sinned, we've sinned, we have erred. And do you know what God does with humble people like that? He shows them wondrous things out of his law. Look at what God showed him. You're in Daniel 9. In Daniel, the ninth chapter now, notice what the Bible says. In Daniel, the ninth chapter, look at what the Bible says in verse 21. I love this. It says in Daniel 9, right there, in verse, in fact, look at what it says in verse 19. We'll take it down a little bit. It says in verse 19, O oh Lord, hear, O oh Lord, forgive, O oh Lord. Hearken and do, defer not for thine own sake, O oh my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. And whilst I was yet speaking and praying and confessing what? My sin. Boy, I tell you, don't miss this. Confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel. He's uniting his heart with Israel. He then says, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, at the what time? Beginning. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Brothers and sisters, how do we miss, how do we miss this? I grew up in a church filled with hypocrites. I was a hypocrite. I mean, I, I held positions in the church. I was a leader. I was a health and temperance leader. And I told people, eat right, and I'd be there in McDonald's, and I, I had a perfect spot that I would go ahead and sit back there, and if I saw any of the saints come in, I could jump into the bathroom real quick so they wouldn't even see me. Can you imagine my heart was so wicked that I would plan this stuff? All because I just wanted to feed my belly what I wanted. While I was teaching everybody else to eat healthy and live right. I knew I was cheating. I knew I wasn't living up to the standards. 
I was a deacon. I was an elder. I've held just about every position in my church. And here it is that in all of the positions that I held, I knew my hypocrisy. I knew my inconsistency. This is why I can speak so passionately. I am so fed up with people who know how to repeat verses but don't live it. That stuff does not impress me. I'm telling you the truth. A person can repeat all the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. They can repeat all the inspired quotes from all the inspired books. What impresses me is a man and a woman who believes their message and it's reflected in their home. It's like, wow, that, that's impressive. I'm telling you the truth. What God is showing us is he says, Daniel, God knew Daniel's heart so well that Daniel didn't even need to finish the prayer. The Bible says at the beginning of his prayer, that means that as soon as Daniel said, oh Lord, God said, Gabriel, and God immediately goes to Gabriel and says, Gabriel, listen, go down and visit Daniel. He needs his eyes open. And by time Daniel says, amen. And Daniel looks up, Gabriel's right there, Daniel. Thou art great in love with that man. And Gabriel begins to open Daniel's eyes. And he starts to answer some of those questions that was perplexing that son of God. My heart's prayer. Help me to have such a heart, Father. Help me to be so genuine and so consistent that by your grace, I can please you. I've spent most of my life displeasing God. I want to close it out pleasing him. And so it is that Daniel clearly was pleasing God. I mean, it was evidently clear. And so it is that, that, that Daniel, he's, he's pleasing God. And now Daniel, God showed Daniel some amazing things. I want you to look at verses 24 through 27 because that's going to make up the remainder of our study time together today. It says in verses 24 through 27, it says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation of for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the who? Messiah. Messiah, the prince, shall be seven weeks, three score, and two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. Two more verses, 26 and 27. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with the flood. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. That term determined in verse 24, did you see that? That term determined, it actually means a very important word. The word determined actually means cut off. Now please notice this, like I told you, this, this, I'm going to exercise the brain a little bit. Cut off from what? In Daniel 9, God is doing a time prophecy in verse 24. 70 weeks, 70 sevens, okay, a week has seven days. 70 sevens, 490. God says 70 weeks or 70 sevens are determined. The word determined actually means in the Aramaic, it means cut off. So when we think about cut off, it has to be something that it was a part of to be cut off of it. Would you agree with that? What was the last time prophecy mentioned before Daniel 9, 24? Unto 2,300 days. So therefore, the 70 weeks is that which is being cut off from the 2,300 days. And so it is that it says the 70 prophetic week equals 490 literal years. But we need to substantiate that. Then it goes on to say, God's people would soon be returning from captivity in Medo-Persia, and God would cut off 490 years 
from the 2300 years and allot them to his chosen people as another opportunity to repent and serve him. What was to be accomplished in that 490 years? Three things. Finish the transgression and make an end of sin. Basically parallelism, making the same point. Then it says, make reconciliation for iniquity, which is to bring in everlasting righteousness. And then seal up the vision and prophecy, which would mean the most holy would be anointed. These were the three things that God says, I want to see this fully accomplished within that 490 years. Now, when I think of the bottom point, seal up the vision of the, pro the vision and the prophecy and anoint the most holy. You remember in Luke 1 and verse 35, talking about Jesus, the Bible says, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that, what kind of thing? That holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. When you look up that term, that holy thing, it was very interesting to notice that it actually refers to that most holy one, or that most holy thing. Christ himself was the one that was most holy. Now watch this. When you look at Bible study and probationary prophetic time, there's a very important lesson that we need to understand. In the Bible, notice this, and the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with men. For that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. God believes in probationary timelines. God does not just allow stuff to just go on forever. God says, look, I've set a time that after this time, there's going to be no limit. That's it. Nothing else after that. And again, in Jonah 3 and verse 4, it says, And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Our God is a very just God. God doesn't just let wickedness and sin run riot forever. God puts time limits, and God makes it clear, I give probationary timelines. I will let you know that there's only a period of time that I'm going to allow this to go on. After that, if it continues, a judgment's going to have to fall. God is very righteous. Now watch this. Studying this, how many of you believe a day in prophecy represents a year? How many of you believe that? Do you believe that? I don't believe that, but I'm glad you do. I mean, I appreciate you sharing it with me. We're just being real with each other. I don't necessarily believe that. I want you to listen carefully. One of the things that I've learned that has helped me in being successful in Bible study, one of the most important skills that's needed, that I haven't mastered it, but I'm working towards it, is you've got to be a good listener. You gotta be, you gotta, they call it active listening. You gotta like, when somebody's talking, it's almost like you're recording everything they say, and when it's necessary, you, play, you press play and you rewind it and bring it back to them. And so, okay, so what you just said was this, 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 and this. Now, if you were actively listening, right? Let me tell you what I asked you. I said, how many of you believe that a day in prophecy represents a year? You said, sure I do. I understand why we said it, but let me show you what I believe. I believe one prophetic day can equal one literal year. But I don't believe that it always does. Now let me show you why. Go to the book of John chapter 2. Let's go ahead and take a look at this. In John the second chapter, I'll show you the clearest reason why when I teach prophecy, I don't tell people a day in prophecy represents a year. Because that's a definitive statement. It doesn't allow any room for it not to be the case. But look at what it says in John chapter 2, and I think you'll understand where I'm coming from. In John, the second chapter, it was Jesus himself. And when Jesus was talking with those Pharisees, the Bible makes it very clear that he said something to them that I would imagine it blew their minds. In John, we're looking at chapter 2, and when you get there, just let me know by saying amen. amen. Verse 19. Remember, a prophecy is telling you something before it comes to pass, so that when it comes to pass, you might believe. Now look at John chapter 2 and look at the prophecy in verse 19. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple. And in what? Three days he's going to do something. What's he going to do? He says, Three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building. And wilt thou rear it up in three days? Verse 21, But he spake 
of the temple of his body. Question, did Jesus give a prophecy of him dying and rising again in three days? Yes or no? That was a prophecy. Question, was it three literal days or was it three prophetic years? So do you see that a day in prophecy can equal a literal year, but it does not by default always equal a literal year? Are you following that? You see that? Helps fix our language up just a little bit. And that's important because I read a little book that told me we're going to one day come up to the world's greatest minds and the world's greatest men and the world's greatest historians. And it says if it were possible that they will pick to pieces what we believe. And this is why it's so imperative that we know what we believe and that we know how to explain it well. And so this is why I'm kind of walking us through this process a little bit. So one prophetic day can equal a literal year. Now what are some examples where we see that? Right here. In Numbers 14 and verse 34, the Bible says 40 days. Each day for a year. In Ezekiel 4 and verse 6, same thing. I have appointed thee each day for a year. So there are times that prophetic timelines each day equals a literal year. But as we saw, there are some cases where the day in prophecy is literally 24 hours. Now, let's go ahead and let's continue in our studies. Let's take a look at this. What event and date were to mark the starting point for the 490-year prophecy? You read it. It was in Daniel 9 and verse 25. In Daniel 9 and verse 25, it told us that there was going to be a time for the Messiah to come. Let's go to the book of Ezra. Ezra chapter 1. Let's study the Bible a little bit. In the book of Ezra, I want you to see what the Bible says as we consider chapter 1. When the children of Israel were now out of Babylonian captivity and brought into Medo-Persian captivity, there were three decrees that were given, different kings. And we need to know, of the kings that gave the decree, which one do we start the calculation? You'll remember in Daniel 9.25, we read it. It said, at the going forth of the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. So Jerusalem was going to be allowed to be fully restored and rebuilt. That means they don't have partial, but they have full control, full autonomy to bring Israel right back to where it was. Now, there are three decrees in the book of Ezra. Again, Medo-Persian Medo -Persian time period. In Ezra chapter 1, notice what it says through verses 1 to 3. In Ezra chapter 1, we're looking at verses 1 to 3. It says, now in the first year of who? In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him an house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God which is in Jerusalem. That was King Cyrus allowing them to build a house unto the Lord. Very kind, very nice. But now, let's go to Ezra 6. In Ezra 6, as we go a little bit further, we then see that somebody else comes up on the scene. And let's notice what happens here. In Ezra 6, 1, 7, and 8, the Bible says this. Then who? Darius. Ah, another one. Then Darius the king made a decree, and search was made in the house of the rolls, where the treasures were laid up in Babylon. Verses 7 and 8. It says, let the work of this house of God alone. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews build this house of God in his place. Verse 8, moreover, I make a decree what ye shall do to the elders of these Jews for the building of this house of God, that of the king's goods, even of the tribute beyond the river, forthwith expenses be given unto these men, that they be not hindered. 
Again, some autonomy to build the house of God. Very nice. Very kind. But by the time we get to Ezra 7, let's take a look at verses 21 to 28. These are so many verses that I'll read 21, you'll do 22, I'll do 23, you do 24, and we'll take it down to 28. So in Ezra chapter 7, starting at verse 21, it then says, And I, even I, Artaxerxes, the king do make a decree to all the treasures which are beyond the river, that whatsoever Ezra the priest described the law of the God of heaven shall require of you, it be done speedily. Whatsoever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it be diligently done for the house of the God of heaven. For why should there be wrath against the realm of the king and his sons? And thou, Ezra, after the wisdom of thy God, that is in thine hand, set magistrates and judges, which may judge all the people that are beyond the river, all such as know the laws of thy God, and teach ye them that know them not. Blessed be the Lord God of our fathers, which hath put such a thing as this in the king's heart, to beautify the house of the Lord which is in Jerusalem together, and hath extended mercy unto me before the king and his counselors, and before all the king's mighty princes, and I was strengthened as the hand of the Lord my God was upon me, and I gathered together out of Israel chief men to go up with me. Notice that under Artaxerxes, there was a greater degree of freedom and autonomy than what was given under Cyrus and Darius. Artaxerxes not only allowed for the rebuilding of the house of Jerusalem, but Artaxerxes also allowed them, govern your people as you see fit. If somebody does wrong and you need to execute them, go ahead and do what you gotta do. If somebody does something wrong and you need, or something right, and you wanna reward them to the highest level, go ahead and do what you gotta do. You are in control. So it would not be through Cyrus, it would not be through Darius, it would have to be through Artaxerxes that we start the mark of this prophecy, both of the 490 years, but also that 2,300 years. If you don't get the 490 right, you're going to get the 2,300 wrong. And the reason why this is important is because at the end of that 2,300 days, it says the sanctuary will begin going through cleansing. What was significant of that? God is beginning a time of judgment. And that judgment is where God makes what kind of decisions? Final decisions. You need to know. Because, you know, we all play games with God. I get it. We all think that we can live forever. We all think that I can mess up today and just ask God for mercy tomorrow. Well, brothers and sisters, there comes a time where God says, listen, I'm going to say let him who's holy be holy still, but let him who's filthy be filthy still. There's going to be a final decision. And remember, we learned a secret. We learned, most, we learned a powerful secret. How can you know? Let's see how good a class we really are. How can you know if you're on the road to being holy still or unholy still? How can you know? Do you remember, do you remember that very important lesson that we went over? We forgot. Luke 16. Let's go there. In Luke 16, how can you know? And this is very important. How can you know if you are on the road of holy still or filthy still? We taught it the other night. It's all right. I'm here to remind you. Luke 16. The Bible says in Luke 16, right there in verse 10. It was in Luke 16 and verse 10. How can I know if I'm preparing to be holy still or if I'm preparing to be unholy still? It says in Luke 16 and verse 10, to him that knows, oh, I'm so sorry, it says in Luke 16 and verse 10, he that is faithful in that which is least. 
is faithful also in much. But he who is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. It's the little decisions you make every day that's preparing you to either be holy still or filthy still. And so this is why never even look at a small decision carelessly. Even in the small decisions of life, you always want to say, Lord, am I making the right decision? And you go to his word and let the Bible be your man of counsel. Well, the Bible has been our man of counsel. And here it is. The starting event was a decree from Persian King Artaxerxes authorizing God's people who were captive in Medo-Persia to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the city. The decree found in Ezra chapter 7 was issued in 457 B.C. Now, here we go again. I told you. What was the class I hated most in school? History. History. Couldn't stand it. <coughs> History class was punishment. But nevertheless, now I look back at it and it's a blessing. So one day I went and now that I'm into history, I bought the Encyclopedia Britannica. I didn't even want to go online. I wanted the books. So I got the whole set, right? And when you start going through that time period of 457 B.C., look at what you find. Artaxerxes I, Persian, whose rule is through Arta, which is true, was the fifth king of kings of Persia from 464 B.C. to 424. He was the son of Xerxes I of Persia and Amistris, daughter of Otanes. Notice this. 457 B.C. Artaxerxes I decrees that the city government of Jerusalem be re-established. That's amazing. Amen. I mean, that's, that's history. There's no religious writer who influenced that. That is pure history. And so here it is that I began, I'm telling you, when you study Bible prophecy, you start realizing this is not an ordinary book. This is why, you know, this, this is why, brothers and sisters, the more that I started to discover how this is the word of God, I don't even use it as an armrest. This is the word of God. I remember I used to take my Bible and I'd take things like phones and stuff and just rest it on top of my Bible. When I started understanding how sacred this book is and all this teeth, man, I don't even put anything on top of it. If anything, I put my Bible on top of everything else. I give myself little symbolic reminders that this is not an ordinary book because we definitely do not serve an ordinary God. We serve a supernatural God. We serve an extraordinary God. We serve the one who is the creator of all things. And so the more that we begin to study prophecy, I realize it cements you in knowing this is the word of God and therefore there is the God of the word. He exists. And that is how it can actually help your anxiety. We'll talk about that later this afternoon. When you know that God exists, you don't worry as much about the future because you know who holds it in his hands. And you know he's on your side. And so the more that I studied this, I said, wow, this is incredible. So I started looking because, again, I used to be Muslim. So I started to look at Islam. I started to study it. What do Muslims think about the prophet then? I just started checking it out. What, what do the Muslims say? What do these groups say? So I started looking. In Islam, generally, this is what is taught about Daniel. Daniel, Arabic, is usually considered by Muslims to have been a prophet, although he is not mentioned in the Quran. Did you know that? Daniel is not, Daniel's not mentioned in the Quran at all. The Quran is the Muslim's holy book. It's their Bible. Okay? But Daniel is not mentioned in the Quran, which I thought was very interesting. It says there are a few hadith. Now, what is a hadith? a traditional account of things said or done by Muhammad or his companions. So in the Hadith, you do see some things said about Daniel, but not in the actual Quran. Now it says, and Muslim records which bear his name and which refer to his time spent in the den of lions. So at best, Daniel's just kind of like a historical figure. They go, yeah, he's a prophet, but he apparently wasn't important enough to be put in their holy book. So then I said, well, what about Jews? I mean, Daniel's the Old Testament. So I said, certainly Jews have a great view towards Daniel. So I started to look up the Jews and Judaism. What is their view on the prophet Daniel? Notice, a book of the Torah. They say, oh yes, Daniel is a book of the Torah. Or the writer of that book. The book is included in the writings, but not the prophets. Very interesting. Because by definition... 
prophecies are meant to be proclaimed, and his visions were meant to be written, but not proclaimed. So they have like a very interesting view. So true story. I used to work at an organization called YAI, Young Adults Institute. And when I worked at YAI, I remember that I had a Jewish coworker. And so we started talking about Jesus, and she knew that I was a Christian. And so as we started to talk about Jesus, um, she got very interested. And I started to teach Jesus according to the Bible prophecy. And one day I told her, I said, Sis, I said, I don't really understand why Jew if I may be honest with you, I said, I don't understand why Jewish people have such a problem with Jesus. Because he was specifically prophesied of when he was going to be anointed. In the Bible. She says, what? Where is that? I said, Daniel 9. I started to walk her through Daniel 9. She loved it. She was like, I cannot believe this. There's a timeline to when the prophets, when the Messiah would be anointed, the Messiah we're looking for, and the Bible actually says when he'd be anointed, and here it is, AD 31. So she saw it, right? AD 27. So then when she saw it, she then, I said, share it with your rabbi. She said, I'm so going to share this with my rabbi. I said, great, tell me how it went tomorrow. So she comes to work, and all of a sudden, I'm at work like the regular Dwayne. So I'm at work like, hey, what's going on? You know, I'm a really happy guy. So I was just like, hey, what's happening? She was just like, hi. And then she would, and she kind of walked away from me. So I was just like, that was weird. So I went to her again like, hey, what's happening? She was just like, hi. And she was very evasive, just staying away from me. And so at a certain point, lunch break, you know, we could talk a little bit. And I said, sis, I said, what's going on? Did you get to share it with your rabbi? And she literally said this to me. She said, look, my rabbi told me not to talk to you anymore about these teachings. I am not allowed to talk to you. And I was just like, wow. I didn't understand it then, but here is where I understood it. In Jewish writings, in Judaism, there is a teaching that is very important to them. It's not in what we have today as the Old Testament, but it is a book that is traditionally highly respected in Judaism. This is it. It says, May the curse of heaven fall upon those who calculate the date of the advent of the Messiah and thus create political and social unrest among the people. Literally, there are various books, the Talmud, T-A-L-M-U-D, and as you can see here, the Talmudic Anthology. That is the reference that I give you. You can look that up and you'll find the same reference. And so if you go to the average person who practices Judaism and you ask them what are your thoughts on the Talmud or what have you, they're going to let you know, oh yes, we take it pretty seriously and hold it in high regard. And in the Talmud it says, may the curse of heaven fall upon those who calculate the date of the advent of the Messiah and thus create political and social unrest among the people. Can you imagine? The devil hates this prophecy because it establishes who the Messiah is. And not only who the Messiah is, but when he will come. You know, there are many people today that have their own version of Messiah, saviors. And when you go through the various religious groups, you'll find that you can basically pick your Messiah. And so it is that this becomes very, very important for us to know the Bible in the book of Daniel actually prophesied when the Messiah was going to come on the scene and be anointed. The angel said 69 prophetic weeks, or we would call it 483 literal years, added to 457 BC, would reach to the Messiah. So let's just do some simple math. Like I told you, these studies are a little bit more difficult because it requires a little bit more taxing of the minds that some of us may or may not be used to. But let's try to bear through it for a little bit. Mathematical calculations show that moving ahead 483 full years from the fall of 457 BC reaches to the fall of AD 27. Jesus was anointed in AD 27. And do you know the Bible helps give us some proof on this? Look at the bottom paragraph. His anointing took place in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Luke 3, 1. In Luke, the third chapter and the first verse, it was right there that Jesus was anointed. When he came out of the water and the voice came from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, and the Spirit of God came on him like a dove, that is that anointing. He was anointed, 
okay? That happened, Luke 3, verse 1, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Now, there's a way that I could go through this that's for the scholar. Because in my mind, the way I like to study personally, I like to study Bible teachings and try to be so thorough that it can meet the mind of the scholar. Why? Because if I can meet the mind of the scholar, I can meet everybody else. You understand that? So that's the reason why. So what I do is I kind of pull out some details. If any of you have a calculator, who has a calculator in the room? Anybody got a calculator? Let's do something real quick. Do 457 minus 483. Tell me if you come up with 27. Just stick your hand up and let me know when you did the calculation and you got it. 457 minus 483. Tell me if you come up with 27. Who, who did the math? Did anybody do the math? Did you notice that it comes up 26? Okay. So you know what that means. That means that a lot of people could say, uh, excuse me, Mr. Preacher, you are wrong. Because the math shows 26, not 27. For those who bring that argument up, which is a legitimate argument, is the reason why I put this slide up. This is how I deal with that slide. Because one thing we know for sure is the Bible says in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar was the time that Christ was anointed. So all I got to do is go back to history and look at Tiberius and study it. So that's what I did. Take a look. The historian Edward Gibbons explains that prior to his death, Augustus dictated the law by which the future prince, which was Tiberius, was invested with an authority equal to his own over the provinces and the armies. This was not normal practice. Normally, the, 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 normally the one who is in charge, which in this case was Augustus, you wait until he dies, and then you step in charge. But Augustus didn't do that with Tiberius. Now watch. Continuing. In the provinces, Tiberius had equal standing and authority with Caesar Augustus. But it is worth pointing out, I think, that even while Augustus was still alive and technically holding superiority in Rome, all Rome, which hated Tiberius for his stern Puritanism, resigned itself to the fact that though Augustus was still prince, Tiberius had begun to rule. Now watch this. Continuing. Judea was one of the Roman provinces in which Tiberius' authority was equal to Caesar Augustus. And of course, it was in Judea that Luke wrote his account dating the baptism of Jesus in the 15th year of Tiberius. Here we go. Another relevant point is that Augustus' health had been failing for some years, and he was an invalid at 60. Augustus made Tiberius his co-regent, and in Judea, the reign of Tiberius was dated not, this is it right here, don't lose this, it was dated not from the death of Augustus, as would normally have been the case, but from that time two years prior to the death of Augustus, A.D. 12, when Tiberius was given legal equality with Augustus. Bottom line, legally and for all practical purposes, Tiberius was emperor over the province of Judea even while Augustus was still living. His reign began in A.D. 12, and so the 15th year of Tiberius was indeed A.D. 27. That is historical facts you need to know for those of you who are the teachers of prophecy. You have to know that. Because the world's great historians will say, sorry, your teachings are inconsistent. We are at AD 26. The other thing you want to remind them is, don't forget the zero year principle. We don't count the way everybody else counts. Normally when individuals count, they'll go five, four, top number. Five, four, three, two, one, zero, one, two, three, four. That's not how you count it when you move from B.C. to A.D. When you move from B.C. to A.D., there is no zero here. So you immediately go 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. If you calculate it like that, you will end from 457 to A.D. 27. I'm giving this to you 
Because you know the number one way the devil likes to trip you up is to make you think that your beliefs are ridiculous. Once the devil can get you to doubt your beliefs and to get you to a place that, you, you remember, in other words, you know the devil's, the devil's master trick, you read it. How did Satan introduce himself to Eve? He used his master plan. What was his master plan? He came like a subtle serpent, and he came to her and said, hey, have God really said? What's in my tone of voice? The spirit of doubt. That is how Satan gets us every time. Doubt. Some of us can remember we had children that believed in Jesus. We sent them to a public school. They got public education. And next thing you know, they began to doubt everything they ever learned. That's the devil's plan. Public school's on Satan's side, not God's side. It teaches doubt. That's all it does from kindergarten all the way up to the 12th grade and then beyond. And certainly when you get in college, it's over. If it's not a Christian college. Their whole system is based on doubting. Doubt everything God says. That is the success of secular education to date. Doubt, doubt, doubt. And so it is that that's exactly why I'm giving this to you now. It's to help you not doubt, but to know that you have a sure word of prophecy. Let's bring it down to some final points. Jesus was baptized in AD 27. Jesus the Prince became the anointed. Christ, Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior of humanity. Amen. And the Bible makes it ever so clear. We can sing with authority, I serve a risen Savior, He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever men may say. You can sing it with authority. Not only because of Him living in your heart, but because of the faithfulness of the prophetic pen. It helps us know the Bible is inspired, Jesus is the Messiah, and all other dates in the 2300-day prophecy are 100% accurate. Amen. Let me go ahead and get to, I'm going to borrow five more minutes of your time. We'll pause, and then we'll bring out the rest. We have now considered 483 years of the 490-year prophecy. There is one prophetic week, or seven literal years left, according to Daniel 9, 26 and 27. What happens next and when does it happen? In other words, 483 years of the 490 years we've covered. Artaxerxes says, restore, rebuild Jerusalem. That marks the beginning. 483 years later, Jesus, the most holy, is anointed. Christ is anointed. We have one more week left and the prophecy is done. What is that week? So it says, Jesus is cut off or crucified in the midst of the week. But notice that bottom last four words. But not for himself. That's what it said. So take a look. How that Christ died for? Sin. Our sins, according to the scriptures. But he was wounded for? Our transgressions. He was bruised for? Our iniquities. And then, of course, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree. So the Bible is ever so clear that the Messiah would be cut off, but it said, but not for himself. So Jesus was cut off in the middle of the week because, again, since Jesus died after three and one half years, how could he confirm the covenant? Now that was an important question. When you read Daniel 9, it says that the Messiah was going to confirm the covenant with many for that last week. The problem is, Jesus was anointed at the age of 30. He died at the age of 33 and a half. And so it is that he died right in the middle of the week. So how could Jesus then confirm the covenant for the full week? How could he do that when he died in the middle of it? Well, the Bible doesn't leave us a loop to the answer. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. It's the covenant. Now watch this. It then says, according to Hebrews 2, 3, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us 
by them that heard him. That's how he completed the covenant. He confirmed the covenant for the full week. First, himself. Second, through his disciples. You understand that? First, himself. But when he died, he left something for his disciples. Remember what he left? He left his spirit. And then they received the spirit of Christ and they confirmed the covenant for the last phase of that week. The Bible is 100% accurate. Amen. Now watch this. He sent them first to the Jewish nation because his chosen people still had three and one half years remaining of their 490 year opportunity to repent. And so it is, when you look at this precious little chart on this screen, some of you were already given these little cards, and maybe if we have more, we can give it to some more visitors today. 457, the 490 years brings us all the way down to the end, which is 34 A.D. What happened in 34 A.D.? What event marks the end of the 490-year prophecy. Now please remember, in Matthew 10, 6, in Matthew 15, 24, Christ made it clear, I came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I want you to remember that, all right? What marks the end of this? One day, God's servant, so burdened for his people, understand, understanding prophecy, understanding we're living in the end of time, he was burdened for his own Jewish brothers and sisters. He knew we were the ones that were given, we, the Jews. He knew we're the ones that were given the law of God. We were given everything. And so he began to preach and teach Christ, the Messiah. The Jewish brethren hated it. And so the Bible shows that they decided to take Stephen. And they wanted to make an example of him. It was under the command of the Apostle Paul, before he was the Apostle, he was Saul. And Saul, the enemy of God's people, said, stone Stephen to death. Even under that command to stone Stephen to death, Stephen kept his eyes looking up. He began to pray, and he didn't just pray to God for himself, he prayed for the people that were killing him. A true Christian. And the Bible tells us this account. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. Who wouldn't miss a man of God like that? And as they made a great lamentation over him, the Bible says, as for Saul, the same man who commanded it, look at this. It says, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women committed them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Now, I need you to get this. We're about to wrap up. You look nice and comfortable. You don't look irritable. I praise God for that. I want you to watch this one closing point. Go to Acts chapter 1. I just want you to watch how Jesus did this. This is so sweet. I'm about to wrap it. I'm going to let you go. I just want you to look at Acts chapter 1. Watch this. In Acts, the first chapter, Jesus made a powerful statement. Ever so powerful. And I want you to watch it. It is sweet. In Acts chapter 1, it was right there that Jesus made this statement. In Acts 1, verses 7 and 8, the disciples are still a little confused. You know, Lord, are you going to set up the kingdom now? Didn't understand fully the ministry of Christ. But watch this. Jesus answers in verses 7 and 8. And give your attention especially to verse 8. It says, and he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And watch the witnessing field. He says, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now, this is what God wanted. But the Jews, to a degree, still had a focus upon themselves. So you know what God did to help them get scattered? You just read it. He brought persecution. As the people of God began to get persecuted, look at that bottom paragraph. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, 
entering into every house, and hailing men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere, preaching the word. They went how many places? Everywhere. Now watch this. Let's notice, were they going everywhere still preaching to Jews? Let's take a look. Acts 8 and verse 5. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let, let, let's just watch the order. Acts 8, 2 to 4. What happened after this event? Okay? Acts 8, 5. Then Philip went down to the city of where? Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Prophecy fulfilled. Then, Acts 8, 26 to 39, Philip baptizes an Ethiopian eunuch. Then, Acts 10, Peter ministers to Cornelius, a Gentile. Then, Acts 11, 1 through 21, shows the gospel has now been open to the Gentile. Then, Acts 13, watch what the Bible says. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, the Jews. But then he says, but seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. You ever heard of this phrase, one man's garbage is another man's treasure? You see, the Jews counted the gospel of Jesus Christ as garbage. He said, we don't want that stuff. We're happy with the law of Moses, not understanding the law of Moses pointed to Christ. And so they were so satisfied that Paul says, since you deem yourselves unworthy, since you counted garbage, he says, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. My brothers and sisters, the conclusion of the 490-year prophecy ended at the stoning of Stephen. The Jews as a nation originally were the key representatives of God to the world. But once that stoning took place in A.D. 34, it was as it were that the Jewish people as a nation, it doesn't mean Jewish people cannot accept Jesus, preach Jesus, tell the story of Jesus, and prepare people for the coming of Jesus. Jewish people can do that. But heaven no longer looks at Jewish people as the sole chosen representatives of God to make Christ known to the world. Their probation closed. Now the door has opened to the Gentiles. Do you know I was in Canada and I taught this? And for some reason when I taught this, the mic was really loud. You know why? And the doors were wide open. We were teaching this in a hotel owned by Jewish people. And they opened those doors and I gave these messages and you literally saw the rabbis listening to the message. And I made the appeals. I said, even if you're a rabbi, even if you're so-and-so, because I knew they were listening. And surely, I mean, it takes a lot of courage to come in there. I mean, those men could have lost their lives for all we know. But God wants this truth to be understood. There was a time we used to look at the Jews and say they were the chosen people. We don't say that anymore. They're not that chosen nation anymore as far as literal Jews. But now God has opened it up wider to both literal and spiritual Jews. And I wonder who the spiritual Jews are. Go to Romans chapter 2. In Romans the second chapter, as we close this out, what we'll do is we'll pick back up on it tonight. In Romans the second chapter... The Bible lets us know who the true Jews are now. True Jews. Who are they? In Romans chapter 2, the Bible says in verses 27 and 28, it says, oh, I'm sorry, 28 and 29, for he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. 
you and I have the opportunity to receive into our hands every promise and every prerogative that was given to Israel of old has now opened up to us as Gentiles. And when we accept Christ our righteousness and we choose to follow him and his way in the accepting and promulgation of the everlasting gospel, in the eyes of heaven, God actually looks at you as a true Jew, even more than our friends from the East. And so it is that God makes it clear. I'm, just, I'm going past this. This is where we're going to pick up tonight. After AD 34, how many years of the 2300 year prophecy remain? What is the ending date for the prophecy? What did the angel say would happen on that day? This is where we close, right here. And to all the spiritual Jews in this room, pay close attention. Because this prophecy, like never before, is relevant to God's people. It says there were 1,810 years remaining. 2,300 minus 490 equals 1810. The ending date for the prophecy would be 1844. What happened in 1844? Because again, that's the date. That's where all the calculations land. 1844. The angel said the heavenly sanctuary would be cleansed, or the heavenly judgment would begin at this time. The earthly sanctuary was destroyed in 1870. Now we know that the beginning date is 1844. God set this date. It is as certain as the AD 27 date for Jesus to become the Messiah. God's end time people must be announcing it. In Noah's day, God stated that the flood judgment would occur in 120 years, and it happened. In Daniel's day, God stated that his end time judgment would begin in 2300 years, and it happened. God's end time judgment has been in session since 1844. And tonight, we show you the facts of how did we arrive at that date and what is it that God wants to accomplish in us now that we are not looking forward to, like Paul, a judgment to come. But we're living in a time where judgment is coming. And the question is, what manner of men and women ought we to be as God's last day Israel. My brothers and my sisters, time really is almost finished. And the devil would love for us to be so distracted, so caught up in ourselves and our personal ideas and thoughts that we would ignore all these precious prophetic teachings. But my brothers and sisters, God wants us to understand Jesus is coming sooner than we think. But here, listen to this. You heard late earlier where our dear sister said Jesus is coming soon before we sing? Oh, that's very true. But did you know something else? Did you know before Jesus comes, the Bible says a crisis will come before he comes. So we're very close to the second coming of Jesus Christ. That means we're even that much closer to the final crisis. And that means that we, like never before, must be a people preparing to meet our God. Amen. And if it's your desire to be counted amongst the number that says, Lord, as your spiritual Israel, help me to be prepared to meet my God. I want to invite you to stand to your feet. And as you stand, I want you to know that Jesus stands with you. He loves you with an everlasting love. And my hope and my prayer is that we will take our walk with God ever so seriously. There will be some handouts, especially for those who are visiting, that these teachings probably have gone way over our heads, and we're like, wow, I don't really understand, but I want to understand. We have little booklets right in the back on the table outside that we can give to you that will help you understand these things, and you can study it at your own pace. It took me some time to understand it, and I understand if it takes you some time. It's okay, all right? Don't be discouraged. Don't begin to judge yourself and say things like, I can't understand. This is deep. This is prophecy. It's deep. But in time, just remember, you have a helper. It's the Spirit of God. He'll help you, okay? And he will show you wondrous things out of his law. Let us pray. Our loving Father, we thank you so much for what you shared with us. 
We thank you, dear God, for your word. We thank you that we have youth and adults under the sound of my voice in your presence that by your grace can be counted amongst your spiritual Israel. Your people in the last days and every promise you gave to Israel is ours. Every benefit, every blessing you gave to Israel, it belongs to us now. And Father, as we put our trust in you, we pray that you will help us to take seriously the times in which we live. Help us, Lord, to come back tonight. We're going to go through some serious and solemn things. Father, please let nothing hinder. And as we come back together, again, may your spirit truly open our eyes and help us behold wondrous things out of your life. It's our prayer that we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Very quickly, please be seated as we're going to get ready to have our closing song and usher you out. We want to very quickly remind you that 5.30 today, we are going to have a very special health prayer. 5.30 to 6.30, please come back. Please invite a friend. Please invite those who are in the community to come on out. 7 o'clock, we will start our meetings. I would humbly ask for a few people to please meet me up front as we get ready to dismiss. You will understand why I asked you to come up front when we are done. If Sister Melanie is here, I am asking that you would please join us. Sister Evelia, I'm asking if you can join us just right here up front, right after the service. Sister Griselda, I'm asking you if you can join us. Then also Sister Naomi, if you can join us as well. And Lily and Brother Robert, if you can all please Meet me and uh, Pastor up front. We would greatly appreciate that right after the service. Which means I have to ask for your humble forgiveness because normally I'd love to be at the door and shake your hand. But in this case, I have to have a very quick meeting with these precious souls. So please forgive me if when you leave, you'll find that the elders will greet you at the door. But Lord willing, we'll see you tonight. And then that way I get to, to touch your hand. I get to shake your hand a little bit. All right? So thank you for that. At this time, we'll go ahead and have our singers come before us, and we will go ahead and do our closing song, and then please consider yourself dismissed. Those who I called out, please remember your names, and meet us up front, just for a few moments. Thank you kindly. Let us all stand as we sing hymn number 590, Trust and Obey. 590 is your closing song.
Church. 